Hello, we are now recording and welcome to the first of our three Pressbooks Publishing Pathway trainings for the Open Textbook Network Publishing Cooperative. As members of the Publishing Co-op, you are invited to a variety of publishing trainings. And as you all know, there's lots of different ways to publish open textbooks. And we at the OTN want to support various pathways since so many of you are in unique um, institutional and consortial situations. And so we um, want to support your diverse needs. So I am delighted that Elizabeth Mays, who is the Director of Sales and Marketing at Pressbooks, is here with us, as well as Steele Wagstaff, who's Educational Client Manager and Product Owner for Pressbooks. They are going to be with us for the next three weeks at the same time and same channel. Today we're gonna to talk about using Pressbooks for your OER publishing. This will be a big picture overview and orientation to what Pressbooks does and how you can use it in your program. Next Wednesday, January 29th, we'll talk about how to build structure, a structured textbook in Pressbooks. And then our final meeting on February 5th will be about adding interactivity and using plugins. And just to quickly review um, other Pressbooks benefits that you have as OTN members, institutional members can enjoy 30% off a discount on silver plans, as well as one free project in the OTN Pressbooks sandbox. Consortial OTN members can uh, enjoy five free projects that they can offer their institutional members. And speaking of a sandbox, each of you who is in this training should have access to kind of a true sandbox. That is, it's not a free project for you to um, publish in the longer term, but a temporary space for you to experiment in while we are um, doing these trainings together. So if you lost track of how to access the sandbox or need further details, let me know in the chat and I can um, work with Pressbooks to get that to you but uh, you will not be left out of anything today. Um, so please don't worry about missing out. Um, and Pressbooks is, I think you all know, a very popular open textbook publishing platform, and there are lots of good reasons for that. And you're gonna start to hear about them today. And so with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Liz and Steele. Thank you both again. Fantastic, thank you for having us, Karen. We're always really, really glad to be invited. Um, I think I um, Steele will actually be kicking us off today. Um, and was there a poll at all that you wanted to, sorry. Yeah. Thank you so much. I get so excited about the polls and then I often wanna forget them. So I'm now going to launch a poll uh, for all of you. Hopefully you are seeing the poll. There are three questions. The first question is, have you identified an OER project that you will be working on this year? The possibilities are yes, not yet, maybe, I'm not sure. The second question, do you anticipate supporting more adaptions or adaptations, depending on how many syllables you like in that word, or new creations at your institution? Do you see one or the other or maybe both? And then finally, how would you describe your experience using WordPress? Pressbooks is built in the WordPress environment. Um, some of you may not have any experience. You're a total newbie. Some of you might have a little. Some of you may be intermediate. And there might be some total pros out there. So I'll give you guys another 10 seconds to please vote in this poll, which is totally anonymous. We will not know who said what. <laughs> because this is top secret information. <laughs> okay, and I'm gonna end the poll and I'm gonna share some results so we can all see who's here. So it looks like more than half of you do have an OER project you're gonna be working on. And new creations is edging out adaptations. And then uh, most of you have a little experience with WordPress. You've seen it under the hood before, so that's great. That gives us a sense of who you are, and thank you very much, Liz, for reminding me to do the poll. Thanks, Karen. I think it's me to take over here. If it's okay with you, I'm gonna to try to share my screen. And before I do that, I'm gonna drop some slides. We're not gonna be referring to all of these this presentation, but 
These are slides that were made from another presentation that have kind of been shoehorned for this purpose. Um, some of these will be reference points to help us kind of talk about what Pressbooks is at a high level and why it's important to us. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and kind of walk you through some of the things here. Hopefully you're seeing my screen that's been shared with you. Is that, you see some slides there? Okay. Um, the, the basic idea, you already heard an introduction from me, so I'll skip this, but um, hold on. The, the share, you, are you getting a weird green box around things or no? Yes. Yes. Odd. Let me try that again. How about now? Better. Okay. okay, so the idea basically is that when we're talking about course material or courseware, usually the thing that I often emphasize, this is something that I learned from David Wiley, is that when we talk about courseware, it's a mixture of both content, the content itself, and a platform, usually something that was built, used to create, maintain, or distribute it. Each of those two tools are licensed separately. So increasingly in our world, uh, especially in education, we're seeing more and more open licensed content. That's really exciting and we can see all the benefits from that, but most of the platforms, or many of the platforms that are used to create, modify, and distribute that's the, that content, they, those platforms are proprietary or are closed source. And for us, this matters, or for me at least, this matters because we're seeing a new educational publishing world in which this is largely happening. I think you can all read the screen, but if you can't, what I wrote was educational publishers are promoting a digital rental or subscription model where learners are now paying for limited access to proprietary textbooks and homework platforms. That approach, as you're aware, requires the publisher to actively oppose ownership or retention of their products. Like, they want you to have access for the semester that you have because you paid for a rental fee, and then you lose access or you lose the ability to do things with that material. The publishers that have done this and ad adopted the strategy, they've pivoted to digital not because students were asking them for that, but because print was becoming less profitable for them. It cost money to make print materials, and they were getting killed in the resale market, and were having to compete with OER. So the thing I want to suggest is that doing OER, or open educational content, on open platforms does offer us another way. And for me, at least that's what drew me to Pressbooks and makes me excited about Pressbooks, in that we can also ask ourselves, not only what do we want from content or learning materials, but what do we want from the platforms that we use to create and distribute the materials? I put a little kind of link to a story about the public ownership of the internet, but the idea is like why it matters also that we own and control the pipes that the stuff flows through and not just what's flowing through the pipes if we're thinking about content there. So basically, here's a list of core platform principles that matter to me and that matter to us at Pressbooks. Um, the, I'm gonna talk about the first four of them here and then we'll talk about the other three in future sessions. But the first principle for us is that we want the platform to be non-proprietary should be open source and use open source components. In the Pressbooks world, this looks like this. Pressbooks is, our, our founder Hugh wrote this very succinctly, it's an online publishing platform. It makes it easy to generate clean, well-formatted books and other learning material in lots of outputs. Pressbooks, it, most crucially, it's built on WordPress and it is open source. That means that the same permissions that you would get from open content licenses, very similar ones, apply to Pressbooks and the core code. You can download it for free. You can install it on your own server for free. You can edit, you can modify, you can remix, revise. You can fork the software if you use that, that coding term. So we have both an open source project website and we've been on GitHub where you can view the code, inspect it, make changes, make suggestions, add tickets, items, all those kinds of things for several years. In the, in the actual, like when you say what Pressbooks is besides open source software, typically what will happen will be um, Whoever wants to install Pressbooks will install a network. And the network is like a, a coordinated set of sites or books that live under a same, so the same domain. So in the top left of this image, this is an open Pressbooks network that's hosted by an, an entire province in Canada, eCampus Ontario. Here you might recognize this logo. This is the uh, OPTN Pressbooks network. Here in the bottom left is another uh, network that's run by a single university. In this case, it's the University of Houston. So they have their own Pressbooks installation or network. And here in the bottom right is a network that's run by uh, a press slash open community, the Rebus community. 
Each of these organizations or entities runs and operates their own Pressbooks network, but the principle is the same. It's a single installation. It's managed centrally for security reasons and for um, updates and things like that. And then on that network, you can have any number of books published on that particular network. So here's an example of a catalog of, uh, here's nine books that have been published on one particular network. The catalog would let you sort on that network by fil but filtered by subject, by license, you can see which licenses are available, and sort by the title or when it was last published. When we talk about a network being many books, the principle is any individual network can have as many individual books as they would like. So every book will also have its very own homepage. So for example, this is a book that's published on the eCampus Ontario network. The book has a landing page. When you go to the landing page, you'd see things like the title, the authors, a brief description, the license is prominently displayed here, and then you'd see a cover image for that book. If the authors chose to make the book downloaded in exportable formats, you'd see that available there. And then below, you'd see the table of contents. And I, I'm sorry that I left this out of the slide because I know many of you are librarians, but there's lots more additional metadata that displays below. For most people, that's not the most exciting part of Pressbooks, but I know for this audience, it may well be the most exciting part of a book. So, um, so that's the idea, that a book has its own landing page. And, and every book on the network is autonomous from every other book. So each book can have its own theme, it can look different. Each book can have its own set of users and authors and editors. And as you experience a sandbox book, you'll find that your book is basically like a self-contained shell on a larger shared network that Karen or other people at OTN would administer. The other thing that you'll see that you'll spend most of your time in is that Pressbooks has an editing interface. So um, the editing interface looks a lot like a word processor. We tried to make it simple. It's, if it looks like WordPress as well. So if you've done used a basic content management system, there's a what, what's called a what you see is what you get visual editor. If you prefer to work in HTML or Markdown, there are those options for you as well. And then you can also publish it, decide whether it's visible on the web, whether it's included in the exports, does you need a password to read it. And then you can see a revision history. So if you wanted to see what past edits of this chapter looked like and revert to a previous edit because you made a mistake, those are gonna be visible there for you. The other idea is that many authors can collaborate on the same book. And so what would happen would be, you're working together in a book and this would be your organized page or your table of contents in the back end. And I might say, Sun Yi, I want you to, you're responsible for these two chapters here. And Karen, you're gonna work on the next two chapters. Cheryl, you're gonna work on the following two chapters, for example. And Emily, these last three are yours. So what would happen would be each one of us could log into this interface and be like, oh, I'm gonna edit my chapter at the same time that Sun Yin is editing her chapter and Karen, Karen's editing her chapter. We can also reorder and reorganize pages or chapters from this view. You can click it, drag and drop. And so you can move your table of contents around in a kind of flexible way. You can decide whether stuff will be visible in the web version of the book kind of separately, and also whether it would be included in various exports you'd make. So you can have a web version of the book that's different from your print version or different from your ebook for whatever reason you want. Um, the other thing that's real important for us is that we want content to be able to be made personal, to be able to make it local. When we talk about the five R's or the permissions, it's what you can do with the book to personalize it or localize it. So we want to support those open permissions. We want to let you quickly clone, revise, and remix content. The first thing that's important for us is that people should be able to indicate what license they want to have for their content. So for the chapter itself, you can select all rights reserved or any of the Creative Commons licenses or indicate that the material is in the public domain. You can do that for the book itself, and you can also override that on a chapter level. So works can have uh, patchwork licenses if different contributors feel differently about their contributions. The second thing, and Liz will show this later, is that you can clone any openly licensed book from any network to any network. We will make a whole copy of the book, and it's a local copy that's then ready for you to edit, revise, and remix. Finally, once a book is cloned, you'll then see an automatic attribution statement on the resulting book. And you'll also be able to compare if you want to. You could compare on what you're seeing here is on the left hand pane is what's been changed in, in the book, the active book you're viewing, 
and the right hand pane would be the original and what's different in the original. So that's a comparison tool if you want to see how a revised book differs from the original if the source was press books. Finally, uh, the, another thing that's really important for us as an EdTech vendor is um, users should be able to come and go freely. If they can't, I think that's a sign of an abusive relationship. So um, we want to avoid vendor lock-in and allow people to easily import and export their content in and out of the platform. So there's an import tool that we'll show you in the demo later, and you can bring in content from lots of different file formats quickly into Pressbooks. You can also export. So once you've made a Pressbooks book, you might decide you want to leave Pressbooks for a different platform. We, we hope our platform is good enough to keep you, but if it's not, take your content and do what you want with it. There's all of these different export formats that we support. Um, it's hard to see from the screen, so I, we'll talk about them a little bit later, but it's PDF, EPUB, Mobi files, uh, some exotic flavors of EPUB and XHTML. We support HTML book, a Word document or open document. XML flavors, and common cartridge files, which help you bring it into a learning management system. We also have a bunch of different export options when you're making your print PDF. So you don't have to know InDesign, and you don't have to know book design perfectly. We want this to be basically a DIY tool that helps people make their exports look good enough for print without having to know computer programming or graphic design in an advanced way. I'm finally playing well with others. Librarians are the ones who taught me about this when I was in library school, this mattered a lot. Do you use and do you conform with broadly accepted standards? So there's a whole bunch of standards that we try to make sure our tool complies with. In the web world, it's HTML and CSS. We use the schema.org microdata. We also support all those flavors of exports that you were talking about and imports. Accessibility is really important to us. I believe we'll talk about that in the future. So we've, we've done an accessibility audit and have a VPAT that shows our compliance in both the uh, editing interface with WCAG 2A and AA standards. And we also support some IMS global standards that let you bring your content in and out of learning management systems, as well as single sign-on. So what that might look like would be, if you wanted to use single sign-on and use your NetID system at your school, there'd be a little button that lets you log in with your NetID. I'm using an example from the University of Iowa. When they click that, They'd enter their net ID and either Pressbooks account could be provisioned or they could log in with it. I believe the University of Minnesota is doing that, so I saw Karen nodding. It's an easier way to manage accounts than having to have separate accounts for Pressbooks versus accounts for your email or whatever. And finally, you can bring content into the learning management system with an LTI connection. So in this image, what you're seeing is a whole bunch of links of Pressbooks chapters in the LMS, just like you were working in the Canvas course. And what a user would see when they click that link would be, the live version of their Pressbook just loading natively in the LMS. The learner feels like they're still in the LMS, but they're actually seeing the live version of your web book. So it can, make, it can lower the cognitive load and the learner feels like they're studying in the LMS, but what they're really seeing is open content that's been provided for them through Pressbooks and has been edited and maintained in Pressbooks. Okay, that was a big kind of rambling introduction. I think now we're gonna to get to the bit more of a fun part. Liz, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Fantastic. Thanks, Dale. Um, so just to sort of summarize um, sort of the evolution of Pressbooks, you may have heard of Pressbooks at different times. Um, Pressbooks really began as an authoring platform um, that was really good at making all of these different formats um, without needing the knowledge to manually make those with development or graphic design skills. Um, as we've evolved, we've really seen this use case in OER and we've seen more and more, we have roughly 80 clients in North America now colleges and universities using Pressbooks usually to produce um, OER, whether it's uh, new creations or adaptations. And a few years back, we added um, some features that really um, grew Pressbooks capabilities as an adaptation tool. So now um, with our cloning tool, it makes it very, very simple to adapt a good portion of the content that is already out there. So if you have Pressbooks, you're not always starting with nothing. You could start with 90% of a book in most cases or a 
a full book and start adapting from there. Um, as we go forth, we've seen a large demand to, as, Press, as Steele demonstrated, to sort of deliver content in the LMS in some cases. Um, so Pressbooks is also a delivery tool in that way. And we are working on making that more and more the case for those institutions who do want those capabilities. How, how else can we help to deliver the content in a seamless and elegant way to your learners? Um, I wanted to show some examples, so I'm going to start sharing my screen uh, of sort of what the possibilities are. Uh, so I've pulled up just a few different types of books that I've seen made on Pressbooks that I think are inspiring, uh, and I'll just go through a few of those here. Uh, one typical use case that we've seen is student success manuals, um, university success manuals, college success manuals, um, how to learn, um, how to you know manage your time. Uh, this is just one example of that. Uh, this is from Dave Dillon. Uh, I think he's done several iterations on this, in fact. Uh, another example coming out of University of Texas at Arlington, uh, they have a college success manual as well that they have built on Pressbooks. Um, and I could probably go to most of the networks and find something similar. Uh, this happens to be from University of Saskatchewan and they made this master uh, university success book, but then different departments within University of Saskatchewan then remixed it on the same network. They cloned and remixed it to um, create a manual that was appropriate to their specific college or department. Um, so many things you could do uh, in that regard. Um, another thing we've seen a lot of is anthologies and open pedagogy projects. And I'm sure most people are familiar with Robin DeRosa's very well-known open anthology to earlier American literature. This is an open anthology that she um, worked with her students in her classroom to build, um, built primarily from public domain texts. And this book has actually been remixed uh, by, and that remix was led by Timothy Robbins in his classroom. Uh, into the open anthology of earlier American literature. Um, and there are different texts featured in this one as well. And so each um, person sort of leading one of these has brought their own perspectives to it um, and really built upon it. So you could even use a mashup of both of these if you wanted to mix these together, for instance, on, on press books, that would be something you could do or just add them together um, and have an even longer anthology. A similar project is the open anthology of Hispanic literature. Uh, and this was a project at Oklahoma that also involves students in a classroom. Uh, they took, again, um, historic uh, texts from Hispanic literature, and then the students, uh, through the research that they did that semester, they authored critical introductions under the instructor's um, guidance and supervision and editing and that sort of a thing. Um, so that's a, a few examples from anthologies. Another use case we're seeing a lot is language textbooks, and this is um, a project out of University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, it is a Portuguese textbook, and the way they've structured this is they have a lesson followed by a dialogue um, continuously throughout the book, and then they really utilize the interactive features of Pressbooks to make that exciting uh, to their students and engaging. So here they've uploaded an audio file of a conversation, they've included a transcript of that dialogue, and then they've used the H5P plugin that's available in Pressbooks EDU to then quiz, let the students basically self-quiz themselves um, on what they just heard and read in that dialogue um, to see what they remember. So just again, getting them to engage with the material so it's not just all like a learn this kind of wall of text. Um, another book that recently I saw on Twitter uh, is this uh, Italian textbook uh, coming out of Muhlenberg College, I believe, and that has, that is, um, unfortunately Google is translating this for me, it, it should be in Italian. <laughs> Um, and then I'm going to, there's a couple more projects. Some of these are sort of community university partnerships and I'll let Steele speak to some of these, but I will continue with sharing my screen. Sure. Yeah. Some of these came from my time at Wisconsin. So that's probably why Liz is. So I used to work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and this was one of my favorite projects in that there was a group of students who worked with the local historical society as like a university community partnership. This new historic, this historical society was opening a brand new museum and their very first exhibit was going to be about making ethnic identity through objects. Um, and it's called Creators, Collectors and Communities. 
Uh, and this was a book that they made as an open, uh, open book available on the web, but it was also the exhibit catalog for the opening exhibit. So the Historical Society was really interested because they printed these beautiful print editions and had them to hand out in their community, and they were so proud of this, and the students wrote uh, so much for this guide that if you open the next tab, Liz, they, over, they overstepped the bounds of the catalog and had to make like a 350-page ebook with all of their extra research and their they told a bunch of these object stories and they really got into the provenance of these objects. And this turned into a big award-winning project there that was like the a University Community Partnership and Ex Excellence Award. Um, and it was a, an open education project really as well and uh, one of those renewable assignments that everybody was quite proud of. Um, Tim asked a question in the chat, Liz, about if Google is translating, how do we prevent it for the student? Um, that was a browser choice that I think Liz made that says, yes, translate this before the demo. Yeah, Is sorry it? about that. I make bad browser choices a lot. <laughs> um, the question, can you, can you prevent translation for language textbooks? Uh, it depends on how smart the browser is generally. Um, I don't, you can probably tell the browser in some way or put some code in there saying don't translate, but uh, users can usually have the browser do almost whatever they want. Yeah, Karen says, I don't think you can prevent it. I tend to agree, Karen. Um, okay, Liz, take us to the next example yeah. then. Uh, this was a really cool project. Uh, it's a similar idea where there was a political science, the chair of the political science department taught a summer course in professional development for high school teachers. And so he'd been putting together these readers for high school teachers to discuss teaching, and he started making them in press books. And so these are historical documents about different democratic ideas that he and his peers will read together, and then using hypothesis, which we'll talk about in another presentation, they annotate them and they have an online discussion about how they would teach this text. And then they meet together only twice in the summer, but at, they, they feel like they've got to know each other because they've made a whole bunch of it. It's not on this layer, Liz, we'll show it somewhere else. But, but, but um, there's a whole bunch of ways that, that they've used this to do faculty professional development and to have people distributed across a very large community feel like they're in a learning community together with an open text um, that's just web-based there. Um, the next example uh, is another great example that came from the uh, Ohio State University. I always have to say the Ohio State University. And this is an example of like a, a history or a government text, some keys to understanding the Middle East. They had some faculty authors that wanted to um, produce like an introductory reader for understanding the Middle East, and they published this and made it available under an open license. And then another great project from Muhlenberg College um, 2018, the political year of the women. I think we should make it 2019, 2020. I mean, why stop with just one year? But they had uh, a bunch of student authored, these are student authored research papers for a seminar uh, in gender and women's studies. And the students wrote these research papers with the idea that it would be an edited collection. Um, and they're really outstanding. I mean, I, I, in reading this, I, I, it wasn't always clear to me that this was undergraduate research. It was really impressive. Um, and then, Liz, you got the last couple, I think. Oh, I have somehow not put them up. Hold Maybe on. there's more examples and we'll we pop, pop them in the, in the chat. Or oh, what you, you know think? what? I found it. I'm sorry. Okay, Here we cool. go. Um, yeah, so one other example is sort of that notion of study guides. So a lot of what I've seen coming across Pressbooks is things like, you know, how to do research in this discipline or how to write for college or how to write for graduate school, how to cite things in, you know, in this particular case, you know, how to do a literature review for, you know, education and nursing graduate students, very specific types of things that students may not come in already knowing and sort of creating that background for them in and I've also seen, and I did not bring any examples today, but other things I've seen is just, you know, faculty education as well. So, you know, how how to create, you know, impactful online classes or, um, you know, how to do open pedagogy in your classroom, all sorts of things like that. You could use this in a variety of ways for professional development, um, for staff. Um, something someone told us today is they wanted to see if they could use, you know, Pressbooks for HR manuals or um, just employee manuals. And, and we said, well, yeah, you could do that. That's very interesting. I've heard of people using it for syllabi. Um, it's just a way to make these elegantly laid out formats that come in a lot of different export formats that can be useful um, depending on the context you need them in. Um, but if it's okay, I'm going to sort of transition now and I'm going to show just a very high level couple of things in Pressbooks and sort of give you a sense of how the tool works. We'll get much more uh, deeply, oops, deeply into this uh, later 
later in the series. Um, but for today, I will give you just like a little bit of a background. And so where I am right now is I'm in the Open Textbook Network Library. And they have this wonderful um, library where you can browse different subjects and find OER in your discipline. And so I was looking for a book uh, built on Pressbooks, and it is not hard to find one, but I decided that I would choose this one. Um, this is a book built on Pressbooks. When I go to the multiple formats, it brings me to the Pressbooks version. And then let's say that I am teaching a class that I need my students to read this for, and I'd like to make some changes to it. Um, it's almost there, but I want to remix this just a bit. Um, so I am going to go into my Pressbooks EDU network, and I'm going to clone the book uh, into an editable form. And all I need in order to do that is I need the URL of the book, and it does need to be built on Pressbooks and openly licensed uh, and public, which that book met all of those qualifications. And then I just add, you know, my title for the book uh, and my URL for the remix. And a few minutes from now, I will have an editable version of this in an interface that functions very much like WordPress. And so I will be able to do things like delete parts of it, add parts to it, uh, I can edit within the chapters. I can, you know, of course, credit uh, anyone who contributes to the adaptation um, at the chapter or and or the book level. Um, and what's really nice is if there were exercises in this book or if there is media in this book, all of that's going to come over. All of the attributions for the original authors will also come over. So I basically have everything I need to do um, a very easy uh, remix of this book. And so I think it took 37 seconds, Liz, I was counting. If <laughs> Good. I just want to interject here um, because you are showing us the, um, the Pressbooks interface for the first time really here. And so I just want to point out um, to those of you who are watching that Liz switched from browsing in the open textbook library, looking at kind of the front facing public experience to the book. And then she clicked into yes. Pressbooks where she had already logged on and she yes. then entered that information to clone the book. So what you're seeing here is kind of um, underneath the hood or behind the scenes. And so these are the kind of things that you can play with um, in that sandbox space that we created for you guys as part of this training. But I just wanted to highlight the fact that that's, that's where we are right now is in Pressbooks um, doing this work. Thanks, Karen. Yes, we went from outside to inside. <laughs> um, so, so here we are, and this dashboard, if you have used WordPress, this should look very familiar. Um, but I have the option to, you know, delete things. I have the option, let's add a chapter, for instance. Uh, and then I like to create empty chapters and then add to them later. So I'm just going to create a new chapter there. I can also rearrange things in this very easily. Like maybe this is in the wrong order for how I teach this class. Uh, so let's start moving this around. Um, I could just say, you know what, don't show a couple of these chapters. I don't want to delete them, but I want to edit them later. Like maybe I'll use what I show right now for my class this semester and next semester I will fix this chapter more to my liking. I could go inside of a chapter and I could say, you know what, I just uh, don't need all of this. Uh, maybe let's just get rid of that. Something new here. And then again, save my changes. I can also go in um, to the metadata. And on a new book, of course, you'd be doing this from scratch. So you would be adding your title. Uh, you would be adding all of your authors, all of your editors, your contributors of other kinds, peer reviewers, illustrators. You'd be indicating the publisher, uh, publisher city, date, ISBNs, DOIs if you have them, all of that, those types of metadata um, aspects. You would probably um, add different, uh, if this were an original book, you would then add things like the copyright holder and the license uh, that you want to affix to the book, uh, and then you would save your changes. And then you can also play a little bit with the appearance of the book. Um, and all you have to do for that is apply a theme, just like if you were in a WordPress blog, if you don't like the theme as it is, or sort of the general look and feel, you just activate a different one. 
And then if you still want to make some changes to that different theme uh, to make it a little more personalized to you, uh, we've surfaced the most common things that users have wanted to change about a book um, for all of the formats. So global options are for all the formats, web options are for the web book that you've seen, PDF options are for print on demand, uh, ebook options are for the ebook formats. And when you make these changes, they just instantly happen the next time that you export the book. And this is the screen that uh, Steele referred to earlier. Uh, these are all the different ways that Pressbooks can export. And whichever of these you choose to export in, you can also choose to make them available on the webbook homepage for people so that you're making the book more useful to students who may need it in another format, more useful to other professors at other institutions who may want to use the book and may want to use a different format for many reasons, um, or even to remix one of the open formats if they don't have a Pressbooks uh, platform themselves. Themselves, uh, and just generally to the public at large. So these are options that you can do. And then, then, yes. Real quick, this book I think is, is still set to private. Would you show them how, how you can take a private book and make it public? Sure. Uh, oops. From organized, sorry, is what I was thinking. Sorry. Ah, okay, so I could just make this public here. Yeah. And then save the changes. And then another thing you can do is you could make this whole book public basically, and then you could go in and say, actually, let's like make the chapters essentially private by not showing them in the web. So that's another workaround. So you could basically have half the book that is showing to the public and your students um, while you work on the other half of the book, which I've done from time to time. Um, so I'm going to pause there. We just wanted to give you like, oh, actually two more things on my quick list. Um, creating a new book is very easy as well. Um, the only thing that's really different is, is you would, looks a slightly different when you're making the initial book shell. And you can work on it publicly or privately. And then from there, the process is the same, um, going on that organized screen, setting up your chapters, um, changing the appearance of the book, exporting to preview it, uh, adding your book metadata, all of that is very similar. Um, the other thing that you can do is you may have, for other reasons, maybe you're using a book that someone did maybe 10 years ago and they just have like a Word document or something like that. Uh, you can actually import that too. There are various formats that Pressbooks will ingest, even though they are not necessarily Pressbooks uh, originally. So maybe you have an old EPUB and that's like your only version of the book or a, a Word document that someone has been using that you want to make more elegant. You just find that file uh, and then you uh, import that here and you'll get the chance to essentially decide which things go into it. Uh, hold on. Uh, here we go. And so I could choose, so, let's Liz, just say this. As, as you're showing this, there was a question from Mandy in the chat that says, is it possible to just pull in one or two chapters from another book in the book you're working on? Which I think is what you just showed. Yes, yes, it is possible. And yes, that is what I just showed. So um, especially if you want to do that, it's probably best to do this, this import method because you get the, the chance to do that. Yeah, and so at this point, I'm actually going to hand it over to Steele. I think I skipped over a piece of of no worries, Liz. It's this good. Part. So um, I will back away from the screen share. Hold on. If I can find it. Uh, there we go. Thank you, Liz. Okay, so here, I'm, when I'm screen sharing now, what you should be seeing is the actual book that Liz just cloned on the University Pressbooks Network. So anybody who wanted to, I asked Liz to make this public. So if you wanted to, you could look at and see the cloned book that Liz just made. Here it is. And I could start reading it. And I say, oh, wow, this is really great. I'm reading this book that Liz Mays just cloned. And Karen was saying, that's the front end. That's the reading view. If you want to see the back end, there's a button in the top right that says sign in. Now, in order for this button to work, you have to have an account on this particular network. I don't know how many of you will have university.pressbooks.pub accounts, but I do. So for the purpose of this demo, you'll see me do it. 
So I sign in and I'll use my username and password, which I've stored. Uh, maybe I stored the wrong one. Hold on. <laughs> I have a million of these. Okay, let's use this one. All right, it did work. Now once I'm signed in, you'll now see a new option that says admin. When I click on admin, this will take me to the administrative backend working dashboard that you saw Liz working in. The first option would be to create a new book or clone a new book here. Or I see the dashboard for this particular book. A very common thing that you'd be doing is saying, I've just imported some content or I've cloned a book. Cool, I've made a book, but I'm lonely in this book. I need collaborators. I need people that I'm working with. Your workflow can be lots of different ways. Obviously, you may be working in Google Docs. Or you may be working by circulating a Microsoft Word document. You may be using Scribe or some other you know, publishing tool that help you with your workflow. But at some point, you might want collaborators here in this book. And so usually what you'll do is you'll come down here to say users, and you'll see, just as I confirmed, this is a lonely book. There's only Liz in it. So I'm going to add some new users. So I'll say add new. The first person I'm going to add is myself. So I, I'm doing this as a network manager, so I have some God powers. But if I were the book administrator, I'd say I want to add Steel. And then I'll decide what role do I want to give Steel in this book. There are five different roles that are available, and they all have slightly different permissions. I'm going to ask if you're willing, Liz, if you drop a guide link into the Slack that describes the user's roles and permissions. And in this case, I'm going to invite Steele as an administrator. And he knows I'm doing this, so I don't need to send him the email confirmation. I'm just going to add him. And you'll notice now, if I look at my user list, Steele is in this book with the role of an administrator. I could also invite somebody who's never used Pressbooks before to join. So I'll say Steele test. And I'm going to make this new user just an author in this book. And, I, and I'm going to send them confirmation email so that they choose to accept it. So I've added a new user. If you're adding multiple users at once and you have special permissions, there is a bulk add feature. So in this case, it may not work for all of you depending on the permissions you have in your network, but this would work for Karen. I paste in five users here at once, and I'm gonna make them all authors, and I'm gonna add them. And it said, okay, cool, we found all these people they're in. Or it would say, these three people we found and added them, these two we invited, go for it. And now you look, here are all the users and the roles they have. I might say, you know what, this Taylor McGrath, she's been awesome. She doesn't need to be an editor. I wanna make her actually an editor, and I also want to make Liz Mays an editor. She doesn't need to be an admin. So I'll change their roles by changing it to editor and click change. And you'll notice now in this book, their role is now an editor role. Users can belong to as many books as they want and the role that they can have can be totally different from one book to another. So you could be an administrator on the book that you've created, an editor on your departmental colleague's book, and you could be an author for someone else's book on the same network on different networks. So that's the kind of idea that you we wanted to show kind of how easy it is to add collaborators and make Pressbooks a little bit less lonely. Once that happens, then you'd be able to see, oh, this organized material, here's the same book. Anyone with an editor view could see this. And inside of the book chapter, if I wanted this to become, say, Liz's chapter, you'll notice at the bottom of the chapter, there's an owner. And I could say, oh, Taylor, I want you to own this, which means if she's an author, she now can edit and write this chapter because she's been set to own this chapter. Editors and admins can still edit, edit chapters they don't own, but authors will only be able to work in chapters that they've been assigned ownership of. And that can be really useful if you were doing a student project where you have oh, totally. students who are owning a particular chapter, but not the whole book, for instance. Um, so that's the kind of basic idea there. The other thing I wanted to emphasize is the way that we see Pressbooks, as Liz was saying, is like we, we want this to be a useful tool for creators, for authors. It really is a DIY publishing tool, and it is meant to serve pretty much any publishing need you can think of. So we're not thinking about this as like, oh, this is a complete wraparound uh, proofreading and book editing workflow service. There are other tools and people in the world that probably offer those services better than we do. But in terms of if you have a publishing need and you want an easy to use DIY solution for it, we think Pressbooks is really well suited for that. And we want to give authors maximal control 
and maximal freedom and flexibility. You should be able to choose to license and publish and distribute your material however you like. That includes all rights reserved. So there are some people who use press books to make copyrighted material and sell it through the bookstore or through the Amazon site. Obviously in this particular workshop, we're talking about open uses and we prefer open, but there's nothing about press books that precludes you from printing all rights reserved or distributing it even on the same network as one that's being used for OER. Choose OER, encourage others to choose OER, but uh, if they have a need that, re that prohibits them from doing that, that doesn't mean that Pressbooks couldn't also serve that publishing need, I guess I wanted to say. All right, that's all that I had that I wanted to say. Liz, is there anything I left out or that you wanted to bring up? Um, not on my list, but I think we should ask Karen, was there anything we missed that you wanted us to cover in the first session? You guys covered a lot. And yes. I can imagine if I had never seen Pressbooks before, I might be a little overwhelmed or my head might be spinning a bit. Um, but, you know, to, to recap my takeaways, uh, there are a lot of great ways you can use Pressbooks. Um, we're obviously focused on OER and open textbooks, but you saw examples of um, integrated audio, visual, um, H5P, which gives some interactivity with quizzing and we'll talk about that in our third session together and then in addition to looking at some examples you also saw a little bit under the hood in terms of using press books and even if it was tough to follow these totally pro users as they you know clicked around just at, at a rapid speed that we all aspire to um, you know that that comes uh, to all of us as we start to use a tool even if you weren't following you know, where they were getting to which screen, I think you could take away like, there are easy, you know, kind of fill in the blanks here, I'm ticking a box here, um, you know, I'm pushing a button here and that's gonna get me what I want. And so um, I hope that you will use the sandbox that we um, generated for you guys. There's no better way than to just log on and then you'll see that kind of familiar red, gray, um, screen and don't worry you can't break anything go nuts I mean do what Liz did if you like and go to the OTL find something and import it over or try copying and pasting um, just you know get your feet wet a little bit and I think that will also help contextualize what they talk about in the next two weeks um, when you have that first-hand experience so even just 10 or 15 minutes between now and next Wednesday I think would be really helpful um, the other thing I wanted to add as a nod to, you know, what Steele just closed with is um, one thing that we talked about in our publishing orientations is that publishing can happen so many different ways, um, but that it's not necessarily about, you know, which platform do you choose or, you know, how are you publishing? It's also deciding, you know, do we want to provide copy editing? So let's say, you know, that example they shared of open pedagogy where students essays are all appearing publicly, you know, in a collective work, I, I think as a student, I would have really appreciated somebody, you know, editing that um, and just making sure that I didn't have any embarrassing mistakes, for example. Somebody else might be totally comfortable with their, quote, embarrassing mistakes out there and crowdsourcing their correction. So a lot of it is just deciding, you know, what are we comfortable with or what is the author, the faculty comfortable with um, in using this particular tool. So sometimes I feel like when we do tool trainings, it's, it can almost, it can feel so easy, it's almost deceptive, but then of course there are these sort of policy things that we also have to reflect on. And the other um, shout out I will give is to style guides. So one of the great things about Pressbooks is you can have multiple authors working on different chapters. Deal gave us our assignments in terms of what we're gonna write, but I might be, you know, making up style guide. I don't need a style guide, I've got my creative writing background I'm just gonna go nuts and then think about the reader who goes from my chapter to Emily's chapter and Emily's buttoned up she's gonna use her MLA you know style guide and what that might be like for a student again you could decide like no big whoop we're fine with this we want our process public but these are just kind of things to keep in mind um, also as you're learning a tool so Steele and Liz I am so happy that you're here and you showed us all of that um, I, I um, know that we have 10 minutes, nine minutes left uh, for questions. And I know because some people had contacted me in advance, they were so excited about you being here. I know that there are questions out there. So 
Um, everyone, feel free to unmute or put them in chat, however you um, prefer to ask. And I see a uh, question from Emily, and I made a mistake. Either one will work, so use whichever you want. Um, hey, sorry Liz, about would that. You, would you read the question aloud just in case? Oh, yes, of course. Um, Emily Frank asks, if we wanted to mess around the, in the sandbox, should we use the otn.pressbooks.pub or university.pressbooks.pub, or does it not really matter? It really doesn't matter which, they're both, um, again, this is for a sandbox exercise, not for a real book. Um, knowing that whichever one you want to do is fine. If Karen has a preference, she can tell you. OTN has their own sandbox, and I think when we started creating these accounts, Liz forgot, and we put them on the university sandbox, yeah, which we yeah. often use for demos. They're the same. They're, they're the same. We appreciate the sandbox space. So if either one works for you, I'm logged into the OTN Pressbooks uh, sandbox. So that's the one that I'm the network administrator for. Um, so I'd be able to look at something if you had a question, for example. or That's a strong to reason to use that one, I think. <laughs> Karen can help you. <laughs> we can take questions in the chat or if someone wants to unmute and, and speak them ver verbally, we're happy to take them that way too. Okay, we have a new one. Hi, I have so many questions. Okay, here are two. Are there options to change fonts within a book? or can you only abide by the font provided by the theme? That one feels like a plan. That's such a great question. Thank you, Catherine. So the, yes, the answer is you can change the typeface or the font within a book. Um, if you want me to give a quick demonstration of this, one of the cool things that we just worked on is uh, we have uh, our kind of lead client success manager. Her name is Taylor McGrath. Uh, she got her master's in publishing at Simon Fraser and <laughs> wrote her thesis about the library as the new publisher. It's a really cool thesis. It's published openly in press books now. But she also worked on designing a new theme for us. And the theme is called Malala. So I shared the, okay, I shared a screen. Here's the screen. If I'm looking in that theme, this is a cool new feature. So, okay, I'm in my book. If I were to go to the appearance themes and pick the Malala theme, so that's the theme I have active right now. We built in a feature that we're calling Shape Shifter into this theme. And that Shape Shifter theme uh, lets you go into web options and say, what would you like to use for the header font for this book? So in this case, I'd like to use a really nice sans serif font for the header. Call, oh, actually, I want to use a serif. I'm going to use crimson text. And for the body font, I would like to use open sans. And I'm going to click Save Changes. Here in this book now, you'll then see, without me having to do any coding, in this book, this is using the crimson whatever, I can't remember the name of the font, and the body text is set in that other typeface. So that feature is available by default in Malala for the web options. You can have a separate set of typefaces for the PDF, and altogether a third one for the ebook. You can really make this a Frankenstein if you want. That, that feature is right now only available in Malala. We're testing out Malala to see what people think of it and how they like it. We haven't rolled it out to all of our themes. We could quite easily put it in all of our themes if it's requested. So if there's a theme that you really want to use and you want this feature in it, let us know and we can consider turning it on for that. There is a slightly more complicated way to do other typefaces in um, other themes. Uh, and I probably won't demo that right now, but I will just say, the answer is through something called custom styles. You can see here that there's an import declaration for a particular typeface, and then at various places in the book, you would say, use the typeface that I just imported with CSS. Um, it's, it's not for the faint of heart, but it's not impossible either for someone who, to want to, to, who wants to do that. Okay, then the second question. I'm gonna be publishing in Russian, so the font need to be in Cyrillic. Yes, absolutely. So the way that we would do this generally is, if you look at theme options, you can declare language and script support for uh, less commonly used languages or alphabets. So for example, let's say the book is, I'm, I'm writing a book and it's in any one of these um, languages which has a different character set. So um, I think Cyr Cyrillic may be already just included by default for many of the typefaces, but some of these we might need to declare language and script support for non-Latin uh, um, uh, alphabets. Thanks. Um, and Liz may know more about that than I do. Liz, do you have a better answer? Uh, 
I would have gone there, but there's also the ability to change uh, the interface itself to be in different languages as oh, well. Yeah. yeah, so you can localize your interface and have this display in a different language if you like. Um, Cheryl asked what theme, so Catherine, I can try to look it up, but I was working with some people at the University of Wisconsin who were publishing a bunch of language learning materials in, for a Russian class. I believe they were just using the default theme and the characters were appearing just fine, but I could double check on that for you. Um, Cheryl, Cheryl uh, asked a great question. What themes do you recommend for textbooks? Well, let's show you. So if you look at themes, um, one of the things that, that happens for all the themes, if you look at theme details, you'll see a series of tags. And these tags are just kind of the recommended use for a various theme. So one of the themes, for example, is called, or one of the tags is called textbook. So if I wanted to, I could come in here and just search by textbook and it will filter and show us, these are the six themes that, I, that most users have identified as being particularly good for textbooks. It's not an exclusive list, but that's one of the tags. If I were to look at this theme, you could see, oh, maybe I'm looking for academic book or maybe it's nonfiction is the genre. So I could use any one of these tags and I can then filter the themes by that tag. So here's the list of themes that we recommend for nonfiction, for example, and it's different than the list of themes for um, textbooks. Okay, um, could you demo now or another time sidebars and configuring those? What is possible for sidebar pop out type material? Um, we've got three minutes, I could demo it right now. Is that okay? What do we think? Okay, great. So to do sidebars, yes. It would come into organize. I'm in a sample chapter here. The easiest way to do sidebars is to say, I'm gonna add a new text box. In the Pressbooks interface, we defined a bunch of standard text boxes. And the one that I wanna add here, I'm just gonna remove this. I'm gonna add a text box, which is a, an examples, and I'm gonna say, add the sidebar version. In the editor, it'll look a little weird, but what I've just done is I've put in a text box that's been formatted to appear with a certain fixed width in the sidebar of my page. I put whatever content I want in here. And then I say, oh, stop being a list, another. And then I'm gonna save this chapter. Um, and so what will happen would be in this web book, it will be a sidebar. And then when I make the PDF export, it will also be a sidebar. I can show you that very quickly. Uh, maybe. There's a sidebar here too. Export. We'll see how fast my PDF export is. Hopefully it's under a minute, just like Liz's import was, but I'm screen sharing, so you never know. While we wait for your export, I will share our closing comments. Oh, look at that. Go ahead. Closing comments. This will be the big reveal at the end. <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank Liz and Steele for joining us today and giving us this great introduction. And I wanted to preview that next week we will be talking about building a structured textbook and press books. So we're going to be spending more time in this behind the scenes environment. So this will become more familiar. Please do try logging on and experimenting between now and then. And if you want to connect uh, next week's um, discussion with what we covered in Pub 101. You may remember in Unit 1, uh, some of you were there when Dave Ernst gave his talk on structuring textbooks, but really thinking about creating consistent chapters, things like sidebars, deciding under what rules you would use a sidebar, for example. So um, we're going to be um, thinking about, you know, um, implementing and practicing those concepts using Pressbooks. So I think I have a weird audio delay. I'll show the sidebar in a print PDF export, if I can get to it. I don't remember what chapter it was in, so I'm just waiting till I see it. Okay, it was in a chapter I chose not to include in the export, so good job me. Okay, so to fix that, sorry, if you bear with me for just a second, I think I put it in sample chapter, but maybe not. I'm just gonna export them all in case it's in one of these. Okay. And we'll do the export routine again. We'll make a new export and in 30 seconds. So the last 30 seconds, sorry to go over time, but um, it will look like what you expect it to look like, I think, a sidebar and a print preview. And to confirm, three, two, one, somewhere in here. Hooray for sidebars. Aren't those the pink ones? Probably, oh, was it up here? Yeah. Uh, yes, but this one, uh, it, it had something that, okay. 
we, we broke it because we put, we put a, or, uh, an ordered list too deep in. So it was so far indented that it looked bad, but it could look better if the page was wider and we made better decisions. <laughs> okay, thanks. Sometimes, sometimes we all have to troubleshoot, but um, thank you very much, Steel, for, for squeezing in that demo with only three minutes to spare. And I look forward to seeing all of you again next week. Farewell. Thanks, everyone. Can't believe the hour flew by so quickly. I know. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Bye.